our scripture for this morning is taken from the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verses 19 to 23. Hear the word of God. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. We thank you, Lord, for this reading of your holy word. Amen. Please be seated. We have come to a great day in the life of our congregation, and no matter what happens, this is a day that we all need courage and we all need confidence. Our scripture tells us, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And you might ask, well, how do you hold on to something unswervingly? What unswerving means is confident, being confidently hopeful and assured about who Jesus Christ is and what he has done for us because of the cross. Here's what we read. We have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Christ. The, you might pass those words by quickly, but that is a tremendously important statement. We have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Christ. What it's telling us is we can draw near to God knowing who Jesus is, what he has done for us, and what he wants to do for us. And our scripture ends much the same way it begins. Hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. Why? Because he who promised is faithful. Now why is Paul writing to the Hebrews uh, to hold on unswervingly? It's because the Christians were being coerced to fit in with the culture of their time. To the Gentiles and to the, the Jews uh, in many of the churches of Asia Minor, they were told that they were to worship Caesar. And uh, at the very least, offer, even in Israel, they were up to offer a pinch of incense and confess once a year that Caesar is God. In Asia Minor, the book of Revelation written, they were told that um, they had to, had to confess that Domitian, the Emperor Domitian, was the, was the, the living God and their, their uh, Lord and Master. So there's a lot of um, pressures and persecutions. And some of the, as I said, some of the Jewish Christians were being tempted to swerve and go back to Judaism. Some of the Gentile Christians were, were being uh, tempted to swerve and go back to paganism. And you know, things haven't changed much over the years. Christians are still uh, tempted, we're tempted to swerve around the immorality of our time. For example, in Hebrews chapter 13, we're told that marriage is to be held in honor among all. Why? There's a very good reason. God says, for God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. God's plan through Adam and Eve was that marriage be between one man and one woman, faithful unto death as Christ is faithful to us. And yet the world, when they hear that, they say, oh, you're so old-fashioned. Or even worse, they say, you're phobic. You're a phobic. Our culture has redefined marriage to legitimize fornication, adultery, and homosexuality. But does that mean that the Word of God needs to to be changed to, to be cross out what, what the Bible says and to update it. When the Bible says, when God wrote and stoned to Moses, thou shalt not commit adultery. Adultery is taking what God made good and polluting it. That's why Paul writes, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. God commands us, honor your father and your mother. And our culture has reinterpreted parenthood to fit any, any uh, category and undermining parental authority. You know that 
uh, my undergraduate work, I studied social welfare in Sweden. And I'll never forget a professor told our class, as we, and he was a big socialist in the Swedish government, he said, our goal as socialists is to make children see the state as their parents and to rescue the children away from their parents to the professionals who, who know how, how, uh, what, how things should be. But this commandment about uh, honor thy father and thy mother was one of the rocks of Western civilization that our civilization stood upon. Again, as far as rocks, as far as truths, we are taught that there might be many truths, or there might be no truth. But what does the Bible say? Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and life. No one comes to the Father but by me. That's why Paul writes, he who is faithful, or he who is promised is his faithful. So faithful means dependable. Loyal, steadfast, true to one's word. So it would be hypocritical for these Jewish Christians to go back to Judaism. It would be hypocritical for the Christians to bow down and worship Caesar as God. Now what happens when we do hold true? We're told, draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings. Now we have to understand what does sincere mean. Sincere should always be coupled with truth. Because we're taught today that you could be sincere about something that's, that's wrong, but by being sincere that makes it right. Sincerity must be convict, uh, connected with uh, scripture. And if it's connected with scripture, then we can be bold about it. The opposite of, of uh, being bold is to waver. And uh, do you know that uh, Christians in our age have done a lot of wavering and compromising with our generation? Paul writes, let us hold fast to our profession. We're not saved by wavering. We're saved by holding fast to the blood of Christ. It's Christ's blood that makes us able to enter the Holy of Holies. And do you know the Jews that were listening to this about how we could go right into the Holy of Holies by the blood of Christ it made them shudder because only the high priest was allowed <coughs> to enter the Holy of Holies and that one time a year. That was God's special dwelling place that was forbidden to anyone but the high priest. But because of the Christ, because of the cross, Christ becomes our high priest and he invites us in to the Holy of Holies through faith. And it's only made possible by the cross that we can enter the Holy of Holies. And you might remember when Jesus died on the cross, that curtain that separated the temple was torn from the top to the bottom. So Paul urges us, hold fast to your relationship with Jesus. Don't waver. I'll go again. What does the word waver mean? It means to lean. It means to go back and forth. It means to shift the course. It can even mean to abandon Jesus, to compromise God's word, to fit in with the world. And why do we waver? Well, the first reason we waver is we hate conflict. We want to fit in. We don't want to stand out. We don't want to make enemies. We've just finished in our adult Sunday school uh, class a uh, a course on Book of Revelation where the Emperor Domitian issued a proclamation that everyone was to worship him as the only true God. And that put Christians in a very uncomfortable position because he ordered everyone to confess him as God or be put to death. But Paul insists, hold on to your profession. Paul writes, we're troubled. Surely we're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, but we don't despair. So the early church told Caesar, Jesus is Lord. We will not worship you. And they suffered. Many, many Christians suffered in death. And today, in our culture today, many are suffering because they're holding fast to Jesus. Some Christians have lost their jobs, their pensions, their friends, even their churches for standing on the gospel. So no wonder Paul says, we're troubled. We're distressed, we're perplexed, 
but we don't waver. We stand fast on God's word. It's the only, the rock of the word is the only secure rock we have. And standing, he says, standing, it means to have your heart sprinkled, to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, having our bodies washed with pure water. You know, Paul wrote a lot of his letters while he was in prison. And here's what one that he wrote from prison. Now, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear to the whole palace, guard, and to everyone that I'm in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of my brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. You know, people respect those who stand upon the truth with sincere faith. Because of Paul's bold stand, more and more people stood on God's word and began, things began to change. The opposite of not, of not uh, holding firm is wavering and letting the, the world have its way, uh, watching the world literally go to hell. Edmund Burke wrote these famous words, all that is necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. So Paul says, stand on the gospel. And at the end of his life, you know, he said, I finished my course. At the end of your life, do you want to be able to stand and to say, I have. I've done what the Lord wanted me to do. I've stood firm. I've done what is right. Now, when you enter the most holy place by the blood of Christ, you can't go back to a lie. You can't confess that Jesus is God and Caesar is God. Uh, the truth of the gospel has such power. And note that it wasn't armies that defeated the Roman Empire. It was the gospel that defeated the Roman Empire. The historian Gibeon said that the Roman Empire could not stand up against the preachings of the gospel of Christ. So what does it mean to draw near to God with a sincere heart? It means that God will not forsake us. Our culture today says you must compromise to survive. But do you know the more you compromise, the less you are. When you stand for nothing, uh, you'll fall for anything. That's a good, good uh, old saying. Nothing when you when you stand for nothing, you turn to fall for everything. Those Christians could not confess Jesus is Lord and Caesar is Lord at the same time. Neither can we. We should judge a person not only by the friends they make, but by the enemies they make. It's important that we make the right kind of enemies. Jesus said, if we love him and follow him, the world is going to hate us. But when you're confident to draw near to God with a sincere heart, we're prepared even to die for our faith. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul writes, we know that God who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and present us to himself together with you. That's why Paul says, hold on swervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Some Christians have, have shifted. They've wavered, they've compromised their course both outside the church and inside the church. And wavering happens a little at a time, just like that frog is put in the pot and the, the uh, gas is turned on and it's slowly cooked. It might not seem that hot, but over time it's deadly. Paul says, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we've received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sin is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and a raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. There's no other old saying, give the devil an inch and he'll become your ruler. So our scripture urges us, enter into the holy place, the most holy place, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way. The alternative is to waver and to offer that pinch of incense to Caesar. Here again our scripture, let us hold unswavingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we give you thanks to, for your holy word. And we thank you for those Christians who stood on their faith. Because if they didn't stand firm, we wouldn't even hear the gospel. But because of them standing against even the Roman Empire, 
that the gospel spread like wildfire and the truth was heard even to our day and to our future. In Jesus' name and in his power, amen. Let us sing hymn number 358, I am thine, O Lord. Thank you. 